Welcome to Live Doctors. My name is Eileen Eisenberg and I'll be your host today. We have the pleasure of sitting here with Dr. Mary Sano. Dr. Sano is a professor of psychiatry at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She is also director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center there. This is in New York. And on top of it, she also serves as director of the Research and Development Center at the James J. Peters VA Medical Center. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sano. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here. Glad to. So we are going to be speaking with Dr. Sano on dementia and Alzheimer's. And I think the best way to open this up is the most common question. What exactly is dementia? What is Alzheimer's? Are they the same? Are they different? It's a frequently asked question. Dementia refers to loss of cognitive abilities. Cognition is memory, thinking, those types of um, abilities. Alzheimer's is a specific type of dementia that's associated with a certain pathology in the brain, the accumulation of certain proteins, specifically the protein amyloid and tau that forms plaques and tangles in the brain. Okay, thank you. So plaques and tangles, I actually uh, read a little bit about that and I wanted to ask you if you can just elaborate on that a little bit more because I uh, saw a little imaging of it and it really does look like plaques and tangles. Can you just explain to uh, the audience what exactly that refers to? Sure. In Alzheimer's disease, we have an accumulation of proteins that fold and aggregate in a way that causes uh, certain uh, neuronal loss and also uh, uh, poor functioning in the neurons. So our synapses are also the connections between neurons are an area of the brain that is also malfunctioning in Alzheimer's disease. So the three pathologies include the two proteins, amyloid and tau, which accumulate, as well as the loss of these synapses that allow the brain uh, neurons to connect and talk to each other. This is really the source of the cognitive loss, the memory loss, and the functional loss. And for those who aren't familiar, the term cognitive, we hear that a lot. Uh, what exactly does that mean when we speak of, uh, when we say the word cognitive? So most often when people think of cognition, they think of memory loss, but it's not just memory. It's um, the ability to reason, it's attention and concentration, something we call executive function, which is the ability to plan and organize ourselves. Who exactly is at risk for Alzheimer's? Is there a specific age group, a specific ethnicity? Does it favor one gender over the other? Right. Well, Alzheimer's is uh, most associated with increasing age. So as we get older, our risk of Alzheimer's increases. In terms of gender, there's no real difference in the incidence. That's the number of new cases between men and women. But because women live longer, there's more likely to be more cases among women with the disease. In terms of other risk factors, we do know that um, there is a single gene that increases the risk but doesn't determine it. That's something called the apolipoprotein E4 gene. Uh, if we have one of those uh, markers, we increase our risk about threefold. And if we have two, we re increase it uh, tenfold, but it's still a risk gene. It doesn't absolutely determine the disease. So is it fair to say that Alzheimer's is genetic? It's fair to say that there's some genetic component, but in general, when we talk about um, onset past the age of 65, we call it sporadic, meaning it is not completely determined by anything genetic. There is a form, or several forms, that occur very early in life, they're rare, less than 5% of the cases. And that's what we call an autosomal dominant uh, type of Alzheimer's disease, in which family members are highly likely to be getting it at a very young age. But it is a very rare form of the disease. And how young could this be? Um, most of the symptoms occur past the third or fourth decade, but they can occur even at that age, at that young age. Wow. So now, um, with this being um, something that usually comes, you know, with the increase of age, is there a more common age group that we usually will see this in? Is it once people hit a certain decade? Well, one of the interesting things is that the incidence is occurring at later decades in life, particularly in developed countries where there is good access to medical care. So we know, for example, that uh, past the eighth decade, 80 or older, the risk is much higher than it is, say, at 65. Um, we also know that uh, 
across the years of time, in, in, in the past few decades, the incidence overall has gone down a bit. Um, we believe this is because we are managing other uh, disease risks better. What are the most common early symptoms with Alzheimer's? So the most uh, common complaint is of memory loss. Um, the type of uh, example you would hear is a report that someone is repeating themselves frequently to the same person, asking the same question that might have been answered over and over again. Another phenomenon that can be observed is forgetting to do important things, perhaps forgetting to pay bills or forgetting important um, appointments or events. When we ask patients and their family members what um, about memory, the two questions that are most helpful are to ask, is your memory worse than it was a year ago? And is it worse than other people your age? If people say yes to that, there should be some concern and actually consider evaluation. So that answered what I was about to ask you is how you can distinguish between your typical, you know, I'm just not remembering something right now, being very forgetful, I'm very fatigued to, you know, actual memory loss. And is there a way also to distinguish that between, let's say, if someone uh, seems may, may be depressed and, you know, so just not bothering to pay their bills, there is there some sort of a way to distinguish that? Sure. If we see a memory impairment or a memory complaint that's serious enough to interfere with everyday functioning, like paying bills or um, taking care of uh, important activities, it's really worth getting an evaluation. And the purpose of the evaluation is to be sure that all medical conditions that can be controlled are controlled. I like to say treat your treatable conditions. If you have some depression, that should be evaluated and treated. If you have uh, cardiovascular or metabolic risks, hypertension, high cholesterol, all of those things should also be treated. Once those are treated, you can evaluate what remaining deficit there is and determine if it's likely to be uh, progressive dementia like Alzheimer's disease. How do we diagnose dementia and Alzheimer's? How is it diagnosed? It's a great question. When one of the most important aspects of uh, diagnosing uh, Alzheimer's disease is a good clinical uh, evaluation, one where we ask questions that help us determine whether or not these memory problems could be associated with some environmental changes or some other stressors or some medical conditions. When the memory or cognitive loss seems to be above and beyond and continue past managing those medical conditions, we get very concerned and have the likelihood of this diagnosis. A second important evaluation is um, in the case where the deficit might be mild or uh, not well defined, we can do neuropsychological testing. The value of this type of testing is that we give precise, often paper and pencil tests, and we measure your performance against people who are similar to you in age or gender or education. And that type of uh, comparison or normative data will let us know how far from the normal your performance really is. Now, the next question I wanted to ask you uh, about dementia and Alzheimer's is what is the current treatment that is available? Right. So we actually have um, two classes of uh, drugs that are available for the treatment of Alzheimer's. One is uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. The purpose of these drugs is to permit acetylcholine to remain in the synapse longer. Acetylcholine is responsible for neurons talking to each other, and so by keeping the agent um, around longer, we see better communication with neurons and some cognitive benefits. Now, the benefits are very small, but they're measurable, and in almost every clinical trial that's been conducted, we see this benefit. We also see the benefit across a wide range of um, disease severity, so we see it in mild to moderate disease, and now when we do our studies, we actually see it in um, moderate to severe disease as well. Um, the second uh, type of agent is uh, memantine. It's the only drug in its class. Um, this is for moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, and it also has a cognitive benefit. Small, but reproducible. Now, does this treatment, do these medications, will it 
stop the progression or will it just slow it down? Right. These treatments really um, slow the symptoms a bit. They allow for better cognition and function for a period of time. Um, the benefit is always observed, but as we get to more severe disease, the benefit can be harder to realize when one is uh, looking at a single patient. When we compare them to a person who doesn't have the drug, we do still see the benefit. And is there also um, another type of treatment, let's say psychological or physical treatment, to maybe keep the people active, keep their minds going, mm -hmm. or is it just basically recommended to have to take medication? Well. At almost every stage of um, the disease, we know that um, maximizing physical activity, social activity, and cognitive stimulation can be beneficial. It can improve the quality of life and can um, minimize the progression of the disease. You've done a lot of research. You do a lot of research on it. Um, you've done research involving vitamin E. You've done research in um, involving cholesterol, uh, statins. If you could uh, please share with the audience your findings, sure. what, what you've been working on. So the uh, work in vitamin E is very interesting. We conducted a study almost two decades ago in which we looked at uh, vitamin E in uh, individuals who had moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. And we didn't see a cognitive benefit, but we saw a functional benefit. We saw that these individuals managed to delay the time to serious endpoints like nursing home or to total loss of um, ability to take care of themselves. Um, that was very exciting, but since that time, we've had the new treatments that I've been telling you about, the cholinesterase inhibitors, um, amantine. Uh, what we now know is that, in fact, um, these agents uh, can be used, and vitamin E can still show a functional benefit on top of those agents. Uh, that was uh, results of a randomized clinical trial conducted several years ago that showed that this functional benefit uh, remained, although, again, there's not been evidence of any cognitive or memory improvement, per se. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I want to ask you uh, if, if it's possible. Is it preventable? Is dementia preventable? Is there something we can do? So it's a very good question. Can we prevent this disease? Obviously, it's better to prevent it than have to cure it. The reality is we don't have a good handle on prevention, but what we do know is that there are things to keep in mind that can help us delay the time until we see um, troublesome symptoms. So, for example, uh, maintaining your physical health, treating your treatable conditions. In particular, we know that treating your um, cardiovascular disease can be really important to maintaining your cognitive health and perhaps delaying the expression of dementia. Uh, in addition, handling your emotional needs can also do that. We believe that it's important to stay physically active, socially active, and cognitively active. That's a lot to do, but in fact, that kind of stimulation, socialization, and engaging in um, interesting physical activities seems to be associated with um, later onset and uh, lower level of symptomatology in the disease. So I know you work with a lot of people. You work with individuals with dementia. You see their family members. What I wanted to ask you was, we hear a lot about how when someone is diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's or you know anything under that umbrella, they seem to get very lucky. They have family members who can help them, whether it's the physical, taking them to doctor's appointments, picking up their medication, or just being there for them, showing them love. What advice do you give to someone who's alone, who doesn't have any family, and has just been diagnosed with dementia? Well, I think one has to start early. It's important to keep our social connections very strong. Finding people that you trust and can help you make decisions so that when the time comes that you're having that difficulty, you have someone depend, to depend on. The other important aspect is even before we show these signs, I think it's important to have a support system that can help us know when there is changes occurring, to help us know when we are perhaps um, having uh, lapses in memory. In fact, it's often the support system that gives us our earliest diagnosis. So it's important to start early and make sure that we keep those social systems strong.
You spoke earlier, uh, we spoke on camera about how important it is to establish a social network, and in today's day and age especially, where, you know, that's the big thing, you know, we, we have the whole social network with our computers and everything, so I think that's that's very good advice. And speaking of advice, can you please share with the audience uh, what you would advise uh, people to do to take care of themselves, you know, if let's say whether they're concerned that a family member of theirs already has dementia, it runs in their family, or if someone, you know, they've been diagnosed, what would you recommend to uh, anyone out there? Well, whether at the very earliest stages or even pre-symptomatic, I think it's really important to maintain our overall health. Make sure we treat our treatable conditions. Our cardiovascular risk factor should be managed. Our mood changes should be addressed. I think it's really important to, to uh, not slack off on those things that we know we can maintain. Now, uh, what can you share with us about any current research and future research? What's on the horizon here for dementia? Right. Well, I think a couple of things are really exciting. We now have the ability to image amyloid in the brain while a person is alive. So we may be able to tell when the first formulation of amyloid is occurring. So we can identify people at the very earliest signs and hopefully interventions at an earlier time give us the best outcomes. I think we're learning how to attack the amyloid and the cell loss. We're not there yet. We don't really have uh, new treatments that can actually focus on that. But we're really involved in doing the research and asking the questions. I think every opportunity that a person has to participate in research is also really valuable. It's an opportunity to move the field forward even more quickly. So here's the big question. Uh, do you think that maybe in the next 10, 20 years, 30 years, we'll see a cure for dementia? I'm not sure that we're going to see a cure in the next decade or two. I do think we're going to see new discoveries that will tell us better how to treat it and will allow us to see the symptoms later and later so that they're less interfering with our lives. And can I uh, ask you, Dr. Sano, what brought you into this field? Why did you choose this? So. When I first entered this field, most physicians didn't think that cognition, thinking, memory, attention, concentration were such important problems. And now with such a technological society, we've all become aware of what an important aspect it is. So I'm very excited that people are interested in keeping their minds and their brains full and whole for as long as they can. And you're a role model for most women because you're one of the first women who uh, took place in the involvement in the research and development in dementia, correct? Right. There I think, weren't many women around. Right. I think that the whole interest in the field has grown, and that's a real great contribution for everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Sano. This was really lovely having you here, and um, I think you gave a lot of good hope and uh, for the audience and uh, their family members and friends. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.